point. So um, if you don't know Hope, um, Hope Bahanek has been, an, has been active in animal protection and environmental activism for 30 years and has published the book, The Ultimate Betrayal is Their Happy Meat. She is the project's manager for the national nonprofit United Poultry Concerns, the host of the Hope for, Hope for the Animals podcast, and the executive director of Compassionate Living, a California-based vegan advocacy organization. Over the last three decades, Hope has given countless presentations, written innumerable articles, and contributed chapter, chapters to two anthologies. And um, we're just, again, so grateful to have her here. And... Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Hope. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much. And uh, I will go ahead and share my screen because I do have a PowerPoint. So we'll get that going. And while I'm doing that, I just want to uh, reiterate that, you know, I, I apologize that I, I'm not Karen <laughs> and I could never, never replace Karen, but, uh, but we want to get this information out there. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and give the presentation today. Uh, so hopefully you're seeing my power or my screen and now my PowerPoint um, and we'll take it from the beginning. Oh, how does that go? Slideshow play from start. There we go. All right, wonderful. So, uh, I, 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 first, I do just want to give Tracy some props, some big props, because she's amazing. Thank you so much for doing this webinar series. Uh, not only does she run a micro sanctuary, but she also does so much activism and outreach. So, uh, thank you so much for for doing all you do doing all that you do and uh, being who you are. And, uh, and I appreciate uh, being here. So, uh, yes. So, okay, the environmental impact of chicken farming. Of course, the environmental impacts of animal agriculture in general are really coming out. And we're going to talk a little about that in the beginning, kind of the big picture. Uh, but, of course, we're hearing this frustrating rhetoric of just switch from beef to chicken or pork, pork to chicken and everything will be just fine, right? So that's what we're gonna dig into. Uh, and this saying right here, don't just switch from beef to chicken, get the slaughterhouse out of your kitchen. We actually, uh, United Poultry Concerns has that on a bumper sticker. So if you'd like to have that on the back of your car, uh, you can have that bumper sticker. I think it's a really powerful message that we need to get out more and more. So I'm going to find my forwarding and, okay, so just kind of the bigger picture of animal agriculture's impact on the environment. Uh, we have known for decades now that we've got climate change and fossil fuel consumption, deforestation, loss of habitat, biodiversity species, wasting water and then polluting the water and polluting the air, topsoil erosion, it goes on and on and on. Uh, and we have so much information now and it's coming out more and more and, I, and I'm so, uh, happy and uh, um, elated, really, to see it more and more in mainstream news sources, mainstream media, you know, uh, places that you would never hear about when, when climate change came up, when the environmental impact came up, you would never hear about animal agriculture, and suddenly now we are. So that is great. That is shifting, and uh, so that's really good. However, we need to be clear about, about the, the total picture of the impact and how chicken farming is so impactful as well. Uh, but just staying on the larger picture, uh, there's such a waste of resources. You know, oftentimes we talk about humans being the overpopulated species. And of, of course that uh, can argu arguably be certainly true. Uh, and, and I'm glad people are talking about it and working on that issue. But what we have created and done with farmed animals and the breeding of farmed animals on such a massive scale, we've created the truly overpopulated species in chickens and cows and pigs and turkeys. These are truly the overpopulated species eating up all the resources on the planet of our own creation, not of their, in any way their fault, but of our own creation. So uh, the U.S. livestock population on average outweighs the 
uh, the human population by about five times. Uh, for every one kilogram of animal protein produced, livestock are fed about six kilograms of plant protein. Uh, and at present, the U.S. livestock population consumes more than seven times as much grain as is consumed directly by the entire population of the U.S., enough to feed the entire human population of this country five times. Just an incredible waste, incredible waste of resources. Uh, fossil fuel consumption, it takes eight times as much fossil fuel to produce animal products as it takes to produce plant products, and plant, plant foods. So, so much more fossil fuel used. Uh, massive energy consumption. These are indoor environments compared to plant farming. There's lighting and heating and refrigeration and conveyor belts, the mechanized slaughter process, just so much more energy consumption. And then water. Of course, the impacts on water are huge and we're now having uh, a drought coming, another drought is yet, is coming again, not only just uh, in California, but it is just massive. The whole Western, uh, uh, Western states, um, Utah, Nevada, they're having massive, massive drought happening right now. And it's so frustrating when, when this starts happening, because I live in California, and this happens, you know, we have droughts off and on, and it's kind of a continuous state of drought, just how bad it is, right? Uh, and once it starts happening, once it starts getting bad, and the and the, we have like a, a winter where there wasn't much snowpack, and you know, and so the water tables are going down. You start hearing the the local uh, authorities and uh, municipalities are, are, are start talking about uh, how we need to, you know, uh, only water your garden, only water the lawn, um, you know, in the morning, and use just the, the household use, not taking long showers, things like that, right? And I always get so frustrated because that's just that's just a little tiny drop in the bucket, the huge bucket of water that's used for agriculture, which is the majority of our water use, and more specifically, animal agriculture is the majority of that agriculture use. So, uh, you know, instead of sending out these little flyers about, you know, st just taking shorter showers, guess what it needs to say? You know, reduce your amount of animal products. Go vegan. Very frustrating. So, anyway, excessive water use. Uh, we're seeing now um, the, so the, the irrigation to feed uh, irrigation used for the feed crops that are fed to the animals, then the water that goes directly to the animals, right? Uh, and then all the excess use on the factory and washing the equipment and washing down the you know all the slaughtering equipment and all of that. So lots of water use in animal agriculture. And then water pollution, we're, we're, we're creating a problem on the other side. Uh, high amounts of nutrients in the uh, waste that's going into our groundwater and waterways. And I'm gonna talk more about that more specifically when we get into the chicken industry specifically, uh, dust and erosion, all those things. So, and just the positive side, what we can be saving, the water that we can be saving on a plant-based diet. So per day, a meat-centered diet, meat-heavy diet, the regular diet, standard American diet, uses 4,000 gallons of water on average. A uh, vegetarian diet, a little better, 1,200 gallons of water, but a vegan diet, only 300 gallons of water compared to 4,000. So it's a huge, huge, huge water difference. And then on the other side, you can kind of look at it this way, 2,500 gallons of water, 2,500 gallons of water creates or grows 100 pounds of potatoes, 50 pounds of fruit, or one pound of meat. You could feed so many more people on those 100 pounds of potatoes, right? So just so much water wasted on animal agriculture. And then, uh, so just wrapping up uh, the big picture segment, and then I'll get into more specifics about the chicken industry, you can kind of think of eating carbon conscious. There was a, a, a study that was done uh, to kind of make comparisons and kind of be able to think about eating more carbon consciously, and they compared a meat-centered diet to an SUV, driving an SUV, 
a vegetarian diet to driving a mid-sized car, but the vegan diet to biking or walking, that's how much impact you can have. That's how much reduction in your, in your carbon footprint you can have. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the big picture. Now let's get specifically into the chicken industry. And like I said in the beginning, you know, it's, it's, it's really positive what's happening as far as the environmental impact of animal agriculture being recognized more broadly, more in the mainstream, in media. But there's this kind of uh, uh, confusing and addendum message that we see often, which is, well, you can just eat chicken and that's okay. That makes it all better. Uh, right. And it's, <laughs> we, we, like Tracy mentioned in the beginning, we recently had Dr. Tushar Mehta speak at uh, our chicken webinar, United Poultry Concerns and the Triangle Chicken Advocates and the Humane Hoax Project put on a chicken webinar as well last month. And we had Dr. Tushar Mehta on and he was speaking on this issue, the environmental impact as well as zoonotic disease and uh, some other things. But he kept saying something that really stuck with me that I thought was really poignant and powerful. And he kept saying, compared to what? We really need to think of what we're comparing here. So if you're comparing beef and chicken, okay, yeah, when you look at specific things like perhaps climate change, beef may be a little better than chicken. Chicken has a little more impact, a little less impact rather, sorry, than, uh, than beef when we're looking specifically at climate change but there's so much more to it. Uh, there is water use, water pollution, air pollution, all of these things that are just as detrimental. Uh, and then sometimes it goes the other way, then the chicken is worse, right? So, and, and there's, it's just so close. You're it's like comparing apples and oranges. Uh, but if you start comparing these things, beef, chicken to plant products, ah, okay, now is when we see some, really big numbers, some reduction, some, some difference. And the plant foods will always have a lower impact than any animal product. So it's just important to, to think, what are you comparing to? So if you hear, you know, oh, well, chicken's better. It's like, well, compared to what? You know, how about compared to plant foods? No, it's not better. Okay, so uh, that's a little uh, an inter interesting way to think about it. And let's get specific about why. Why is chicken farming impactful? Well, one of the reasons, and I'll go back, let me go back to this picture actually. And so this is, uh, you know, a, a typical, this is probably a chickens that are raised for their flesh, often called broiler chickens uh, uh, in this, you know, huge packed in their barn, you know, never have access to the outside, horrible, horrible existence, uh, monotony, awful. Um, but what we often don't see what happens once the barn is cleared out and all these poor chickens go to slaughter. Uh, and that doesn't happen often, uh, but every now and again, the poultry litter, which is this stuff that they put down on the floor, it's kind of the sawdusty stuff that they put down on the, the floor as bedding that kind of absorbs the ammonia and all the waste. Uh, that stuff builds up and builds up with, you know, pollutants and pathogens and heavy metals and bacteria and uh, uh, decomposing bodies of the poor birds that died from injuries or, or illness and never even made it to slaughter. All of that gets built up and built up and built up. And then finally, after, you know, a while, they will uh, uh, bulldoze that all away, as you see on the picture here, and dump it somewhere on the farm, right? Just dump it somewhere on the farm. Uh, so these places are just burying us in waste, burying us in waste. Uh, these are some stats that I'm going to read that are from the UPC website about the waste in the poultry industry. Uh, and uh, we'll start with this first one, uh, the Delmarva Peninsula, and that is an area in where actually UPC's uh, sanctuary is, uh, the sanctuary where we have our, our rescued birds and where, where Karen lives in the eastern shore of Virginia and Delaware, that whole area, um, that peninsula produces a million tons of manure a year, enough to fill a football stadium. Just that area alone. And there, there's just tons of chicken farming there, right, in that area. Uh, 
in California, an egg factory with 837,000 caged hens produces 21,000 cubic yards of manure per, per year, the equivalent of about 1,400 dump truck loads. It's just massive. And finally, a poultry researcher states that the amount of waste produced in the US is staggering. In chickens, for example, the daily production of waste is essentially equivalent to the amount of feed used. This means for every truckload of feed that is brought onto the farm, a similar load of waste is removed. A 1 million hen complex, for example, produces 125 tons of wet manure a day, a day. So much waste, it's awful. What is it doing? What is, where is all this waste going? Well, uh, it gets dumped. And oh, also too, let me just add to that, that they're also killing tons of the birds and then they just make these mass graves on the farm. I mean, these are all birds that are just being buried uh, because they were killed either in, you know, oftentimes it's egg laying hens that, that aren't profitable to go to slaughter. And so they, or, or there's some infection or pathogen or, you know, and that happens often, uh, some virus. And uh, they will just kill off a whole uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of birds in a barn by gassing them. Uh, they'll uh, sometimes shut off all the ventilation in the building. So the birds just suffocate, die of like heat exhaustion, heat prostration. It's awful. Uh, so then they just dump them on the farm, bury them alive. And again, it's just such, it's, it's, it's a, you know, these decomposing bodies create pollution. So uh, it gets dumped into our waterways, goes into the groundwater, goes into the streams and lakes and rivers, gets pushed out to our waterways, and it causes what's called eutrophication. And eutrophication is when there is a depletion of oxygen in the water so aquatic life can't live. Uh, this, th this waste, the poultry litter, the, the manure, all of that has a high amount of nutrients like phosphorus and, and um, nitrogen and all these uh, nutrients, as well as heavy metals and other things like that. Uh, and when that high amount of nutrients gets dumped into water, it causes algae blooms. The algae kind of latches on and grows beyond what it should and creates these, these algae blooms uh, that pull, draw the oxygen from the water and make it so that nothing can live, no aquatic life can live in those oxygen depleted waters. And they're often called dead zones. You may have heard of dead zones and there's a huge dead zone at the mouth of the Gulf of Mexico because of all the runoff from the Mississippi River and all the animal agriculture that's happening on the Mississippi River. And it's creating these huge, horrible dead zones. So, that's a huge impact that the chicken industry has that isn't even taken into consideration when someone is saying, oh, let's switch from beef to chicken. They're just looking at the climate change piece, that really little number that chicken is a little better in climate change. But we have to back out and back up and look at the bigger picture of water pollution, air pollution, uh, water waste, all of this. Uh, chicken farming is so impactful. Uh, so I do want to talk about greenwashing our food because that's another aspect, another something that's happening uh, with the industry because we've been so successful as animal advocates for 30, 40 years, bringing this information to light, bringing all this information out. Uh, the industry is responding but only in their rhetoric, only in their labeling, not really in the actual uh, uh, industry, not what's happening on the farm hasn't changed much at all, if at all. And we'll, we'll look at that more, more uh, in depth, but, but the rhetoric is changing, the labels are changing, the websites are changing, right? And suddenly there's these labels like local, sustainable, organic, and these labels are there to appease and, and, and soothe the consumers that are concerned, rightly so, uh, about the impact of animal agriculture. 
So let's look at some of these uh, labels. Oh, I'm going to take a we're going to take a little detour right here. Uh, because once this issue comes up, once we start talking about local and free range eggs and all of that, the question always comes up and I seem to always get it at the end. What about backyard chickens and their eggs and eating their eggs? So we're going to look at that right now, right up front, uh, because that's the question that seems to come to people's minds. So I'm just going to cover it right now and then we'll get back into the environmental um, aspect. But but first, I want to look at backyard chickens really quick. And it's really wonderful. Tracy said that uh, uh, Justin Van Cleek is going to be the next speaker next month. He's wonderful and has really some incredible in-depth information about this. So he will expand on this greatly uh, and, and talk about the roosters, which I'm, I'm actually not going to cover. But please come back and listen to Justin because he has some wonderful information about this particular aspect of uh, chicken farming. But I just want to start with, you know, the question, well, what about backyard eggs? What about eating someone's eggs from a backyard? Why not? Uh, I want to ask everybody to look at this picture. And do you think this is the ideal situation for a chicken? Does this, would this be the perfect situation, humane situation where you could eat that, that, that chicken's eggs? It's a trick question, okay? The answer is, you don't know. <laughs> you have no idea. You can't tell from this moment in time of meeting someone and seeing their coop and la la. You don't know. Um, there's so many factors involved. And one of those factors, well, we'll um, I'll give the whole list here and we'll talk about them. And the main, one of the main points is that you want to always rescue chickens. You don't want to ever buy or purchase a chick or a chicken. And most people that are keeping chickens in their backyard that are giving away their eggs or selling the eggs, they're sourcing those chicks from hatcheries. And if you're buying from a, uh, a, a you know, a, um, a feed store or even on Craigslist or wherever, if you're buying a chick, most likely that chick came from a horrifying, horrible hatchery uh, where they are born not in a warm nest with a loving mother, hen, no, they are born in metal drawers and thrown about like canned goods and many of them die just from neglect and uh, uh, transport and all of that. And the baby males in the chicken, with, 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 the, with the egg laying chickens, if someone is purchasing chicks from egg laying chickens uh, to, you know, to, to have uh, an egg laying hen, the males don't grow profit fast enough to be profitable for meat. They just don't grow quickly enough to be profitable for meat. So they're killed at birth. I mean, very soon after they're born, within three or four days, uh, sometimes just hours, they are killed by the millions. Uh, they are thrown away in the backs of the hatcheries, in dumpsters to suffocate on the weight of their brothers or die of exposure, dehydration. Some of them are uh, ground up alive in maceration machines. It's just a massacre and it's horrible. Uh, and if anyone, this person, <laughs> oh, I can't easily go back. I've lost my little well, you remember the picture from before, oh, here we go. If this woman, innocently enough, bought a chicks or a chicken um, from a, a, a hatchery, or I mean, from, sorry, a feed store, from uh, Craigslist, whatever, she's supporting that system. She's supporting the hatcheries. So we must never purchase, uh, and just we shouldn't commodify animals anyway. <laughs> it's, you know, bottom line, let's not commodify these beings and their bodies. Uh, but anyway, we'll move on. Chickens need a clean and comfortable predator-proof enclosure. Chickens require time, care, and attention. You don't know how much attention this person is giving to the chickens. Uh, are they healthy? You don't know. Uh, so, you know, they people have good intentions, I think, a lot of times going in, but don't realize the extent that it takes to keep chickens healthy and safe. Uh, and, uh, and, and so they end up neglecting them. Chickens need to be able to, of course, live their lives out in peace. I mean, that's baseline that let's not slaughter them for their flesh. Uh, and here's the big one. Please don't eat, sell, or give away the eggs. 
uh, this is for someone who's keeping backyard chickens and, and we as consumers shouldn't consume chickens from that situation. Even if you think that it, even if you know that person, she's a friend and you know, and uh, if she eats the eggs, you still should not. And the reason is, this is the, the big picture bottom line reason. We need to stop looking at eggs as food. It's not food. Eggs and dairy for that matter and, and flesh, as long as we are considering these things food, there is going to be exploitation. There's going to be a chicken suffering somewhere. Uh, we, we have to stop looking at these products as food. It's not food. Uh, we need to start identifying as vegan. So if you're in that situation where you're at someone's uh, house and they have cookies and they have eggs in the cookies and they say, oh, but it's from a good source, you know, and you trust this person, you think that they believe that, but it's very unlikely, <laughs> you know, and as we all know, even if they're from Whole Foods, of course, it, it you know, it ho hopefully everyone knows, if it, even from Whole Foods, even from uh, these free range and organic uh, situations, it's still uh, very impactful and, and, and the animals still suffer. Uh, but, but also we just need to start identifying as vegans. We need to say, no, I, I'm sorry, I don't eat eggs. You know, no matter what, even if she just went and got the chicken and you know that chicken's, you know, all, if all these things are in place, <laughs> we still should not identify as egg eaters because then the next time you're presented with an egg, it's going to be that much easier uh, to say, oh, it's probably a good sort. You know, it's important to identify as egg-free eaters, <laughs> eating egg-free, chicken flesh-free. Uh, so, okay, I'll, I'll move on from that. But it's just a question that I almost always get at the end of one of these presentations. So thought I would just cover it. Uh, okay. So let's come back to the environmental. So what about local? So we're seeing the label local on so many products. Uh, we see local, you know, everything now, really. And uh, I, I even, what did I see that was, it was really um, confusing because it was a product that can only be Oh, it was local coconut milk or butter or something, coconut butter. And we're in California. It's like, um, I don't think coconuts grow in California, do they? Anyway, it's, it's a buzzword now. We're, we're seeing it everywhere. But there's been some really important and interesting science uh, around local and, and how impactful it is and if it's better or not. And what they found is really, really interesting a food's carbon footprint or how much impact on climate change a food product has, the transportation percent of that equation, like how local your food is, is only 11%. That's how much it matters. The production phase is 83% and animal products are heavy on production. So if you go back to the beginning of the presentation, we were talking about the fossil fuel use and the water waste and all that stuff, that's the production phase and how impactful that is and the resources used. So, so that's what's more important than local. Local, the impact is very low, the transportation part of it. And a life cycle assessment, uh, which is where they calculate uh, how impactful an, an animal product is uh, from like farm to plate for a, for a plant food and inception to plate for an animal food, basically. Animal products always have a higher impact than non-local plant foods. So local animal products. Local animal products always have a higher impact than non-local plant foods. So the local part, it doesn't matter so much as the impact of it being an animal product, okay? And I'll wrap that up with this uh, quote from uh, a study in the Journal of Environmental Science Technology uh, found that switching just two meals a week from meat and dairy to a vegetable-based diet achieves more greenhouse gas reduction than buying all locally sourced food. So if you're buying all local animal products and all your food locally, it's not as impactful as just two meals a week being vegan. So think how impactful it is if all your meals are plant-based. So that's where the impact is, is with animal products. Okay.
moving on, free range. So free range is a, another kind of buzzword that uh, people often think means more environmental, more sustainable. That's kind of tacked, tacked on, tagged on to this uh, label often. Uh, not just the ethical implications, but the environmental implications. Okay, so I use this picture, this image, because this could be considered a free range operation. The eggs produced in this barn, this farm, or this uh, building could be labeled free range. This is a typical cage free operation. So these, these eggs are definitely labeled cage free. Uh, and, you know, just taking a moment to, to, to take in what we're seeing. I mean, does this look like an ideal situation for a chicken? Absolutely not. I mean, they are on top of each other. <clears throat> They're in each other's space. You would have no personal space, uh, no sun, no grass. No, I mean, no, it's just awful. Uh, absolutely awful. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, um, uh, so the reason, though, that they could get away with you with saying that this is free range is that the farmer could open barn the in the building doors to maybe a little you know five foot by five foot patio mud patio or concrete patio that maybe like thirty of the birds would be able to fit out on of the thousands of birds. And they could call that free range because the birds now have access to the outside, which is the only requirement. And you don't even have to say how long you've had that door open, five minutes. And you can say they had access to the outside. And also with these labels, there's no on-site inspection. There's no, uh, you know, it's, it's really the farmer's word, basically. Uh, so the wide range of differing uh, things that are going on on these, far on these farms is astonishing. Uh, and what they can get away with is astonishing. So uh, basically, though, I will, I will say that if a farmer is giving the birds the space that they need and deserve, and by the way, look at this picture, how much land would this farmer need? If he suddenly said, wow, you know, I feel terrible for crowding these birds in. I think I'm gonna, I wanna give them at least, you know, two or three feet of space. He would need not just double, not just triple the amount of acreage. I mean, this, this building is probably on maybe half an acre of land. He would need acres and acres more land. So now we're looking at a huge land use problem where you're uh, decimating you know, local uh, uh, areas, local prairies and wetlands and, you know, deforesting areas uh, to accommodate all these free range animals, right? It just can't be done. It can't, free ranging when there is a, a free range situation where they have a very small amount of animals on a huge amount of space and land, it can't be scaled up to feed now almost 8 billion people on this planet. And as this says here, this slide says, we would need five planet Earths to pasture raise all the farmed animals on the planet today. It simply can't be done. We cannot scale up uh, this free ranging of animals. Uh, it, it, it just, it can't be done. We don't have enough land and we would decimate the little bit of wild area that we already have left. Uh, okay, organic. So I want to talk briefly about organic. Organic uh, it, it is one of the only one of the labels of all these sustainable labels that really does have some, it, it certainly has on-site inspection, it has a, a vigorous uh, regulatory process that someone has to go through to get or, the organic certification. So it definitely means something, and I and I and I buy all organic or try to buy all organic plant food because it is impactful. It does make a difference, not using the pesticides. But what they're looking at is very very narrow with the organic label. They want to make sure that the animals are fed organic feed, and that the animals are drug free, no antibiotics and and pharmaceuticals that kind of thing. Other than that. 
anything goes. I mean, that's the only, reg the, really the only regulation around it. So all the other things we've been talking about, all the water waste and the pollution and all of that, none of that is looked at with the organic label. Okay, so the impact is actually very small, unfortunately, especially with animal products. So let's look at this, the, this, uh, this uh, chart here. So we've got three diets. We've got veganism, vegetarianism, and then at the bottom, the standard American diet, including meat, dairy, and eggs. And going across is the impact on climate change, this is specifically for climate change. And the, the light green top line is organic farming and the dark green line below it is conventional farming. So I want you to look at the very bottom and that dark green line at the very bottom. That is the standard American diet, conventional standard American diet that most everyone is eating. Now let's say someone said, okay, well I'm, I'm inspired to eat more green. I want to go organic. I'm going to buy all organic dairy and organic meats and I'm going to buy all organic. All right, well, you have reduced your impact a bit. You go up to that light green line that's right above it, and you've reduced your impact by 8%. That's something. Okay, that's something. But let's back up and let's say the same person says, you know, I really want to eat more green. I want to eat more eco. I'm going to go vegan. And now we're not talking about organic at all, just conventional vegan food. Now we bump up to that top dark green line under the veganism, and you have reduced your impact by 87%. Wow. Okay, now we're talking. Now you have really reduced your impact, right? You can take it all the way to organic vegan, and you go to that tiny little light green line up at the top, and you've reduced your impact by 94%. So again, same with local, all these things. It's the animal products that are so impactful. The chicken flesh, the chicken eggs, that's impactful. That's what's impactful. Uh, the, the, the organic thing, you know, it helps a little. The local thing sure helps a little, but getting animal products out of the diet, that's what's gonna make the impact. Okay. Uh, oh, no, no, no. There we go. Let's see, what's next? Okay, well, before I bring the words onto this slide, I do want to say something else that I, I, I wished I had the time to add this slide. Uh, I need to add a slide in here and I didn't, I didn't have the time because I just <laughs> jumped in this morning. Uh, but uh, th there, there's this idea with chicken farming uh, that if we, and all animal farming really, that if we just get the birds out of the barn, out of the building, out of the, out of the cages, if we can just get them uh, out into the field, then everything is okay, right? Then all the ethical issues are uh, eliminated. Uh, and, and this is around the ethics, and I, I think it's important to, to note. It, it, so chickens actually don't really like to be out in a wide open pasture on grass. <laughs> you know, everybody thinks, oh, well, that's just natural. Of course they're going to like that, you know? No, actually they don't. Uh, their ancestry is the, uh, the, the Southeast uh, jungle fowl, Southeast Asian jungle fowl, uh, and they like forested areas and bushy areas and trees, and they like to be able to go up and roost in branches, and they like uh, to be able to hide. They feel very exposed in an outdoor, uh, uh, I mean, a very open, wide open pasture space, right? It's they're susceptible to predators. And that does happen in free ranging of chickens and putting them out on pasture. They certainly do get attacked by predators because no one's out there protecting them and watching out for them. Uh, so that's an issue. There's also the issue of uh, weather, uh, extremes of weather. If they don't have uh, places to go and, and get shade, if they're just in this open pasture and it's 110 degrees, uh, then, you know, like it's going to be today in Sacramento and like we're seeing more and more because there's heat waves because of climate change. Uh, they can get, you know, excessive heat. They can get sunburn uh, and, and heat, uh, heat issues. Um, I mean, their feathers protect them from sunburn. Pigs, that's uh, something that happens with pigs often with free ranging uh, is that they get sunburned, but they certainly can be affected by the heat. Uh, and then 
Um, there's also uh, uh, um, more issues around um, being exposed to viruses and pathogens and stuff like that, being exposed to being sick and someone isn't there watching or, or caring for them. I mean, you know, they wouldn't be caring for them in the buildings either. <laughs> but my point is, once you put these animals out on onto pasture there's this romanticized notion that that just solves everything that everything's all better now for the for the for the animals and for the birds it's not the case at all it's not their natural habitat uh and it's certainly it, it can you know free-ranging pasture-raised birds for their eggs and for their flesh is not in any way uh, going to be 100% guaranteed an ethical situation, certainly not. Uh, and of course, they're still uh, sourcing them from the hatcheries, they're still going to slaughter, all of that. So uh, anyway, just a thought, and I really, I, I want to uh, create a slide, and it's it's something that's kind of new, I've newly been thinking about uh, and talking about. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, let's see, what am I, what am I, what do my slides say here? Organic is local, or, organic, organic is good, local can be good, uh, but plant-based is best. Conventional plant foods cause far less environmental damage than organic local animal foods. Okay, so I'm going to be wrapping up soon, just a few more slides. Uh, I want to wrap up the environmental part with this amazing, what I think is just an amazing study the Alliance of World Scientists is a body of scientists around the world, 184 countries, 15,000 scientists, and they are asked to research certain things and then write uh, their conclusions and then they release a paper right, about it. They were asked to research what would be the most impactful thing for an individual to do to reduce their uh, greenhouse gas footprint, to reduce their climate change impact, right? What's the number one thing that a person personally can do? And they released a report that encouraged people to avoid all animal products as the number one most impactful action to curb climate change. They did not say uh, buy organic meat. They did not say switch from beef to chicken, right? They said, and they didn't even say reduce your animal products. They said, avoid all animal products. Just, it's huge. Uh, we, we've got to get this information out there. And we are, uh, but uh, please continue to do that and continue to educate yourself. And uh, so United Poultry Concerns on our website, this is our website, upc-online.org. We have some incredible information on the environment. One of the menu tabs on the left is environment. You just click on environment and there's so much more. If you can go more, more, more in depth into what I've been talking about today. Uh, I'd also like to give a plug for my book. I did write a book on the subject of the humane hoax, uh, basically the environmental and um, uh, ethical impact of all these labels, the, the sustainable and organic and free range labels. And so it's basically humane washing and green washing. Uh, and uh, I'd love you to check that out if you want more information and a plug for my podcast, uh, Hope for the Animals podcast. I started this podcast during the pandemic when suddenly all of my events that I was scheduled for and that I was organizing just went pfft. And uh, I was like, wow, I, I've got to do something. And I started a podcast. I'd always been interested in radio and uh, I love radio and I love podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts. So I thought, yeah, I think I can maybe do that. And so I did. And I interview guests and it's we have these wonderful conversations. I do some solo episodes as well. Uh, the re most recent episode is on fish rescue which is really fascinating, kind of a new uh, area of advocacy where people are rescuing uh, pet, quote unquote, pet fish, uh, fishes and, uh, and rehabilitating and allowing them to live out their lives in sanctuary. And there's a wonderful woman who is doing that and made, converted her home to a fish sanctuary. So that one's really fun. That's our latest episode and I have lots of others and uh, and coming up just a preview coming up I'm going to do one 
on a rooster that I rescued named Kakuta. Uh, and that's a rooster in Sanskrit, actually, Kakuta. And so I rescued him and it's a really sweet story that I've been wanting to tell on the podcast. So I'm gonna tell that rescue story in one of, one of the upcoming, maybe in July uh, around my birthday. So, so please check it out. Hopefortheanimalspodcast.org is the website and anywhere you listen to, po to podcasts, you know, all those places, Apple and Spotify, I'm on all of, all of those. So you can just subscribe. And, uh, and I hope you enjoy the podcast. Give me some feedback. Let me know what you think. And let's see. So last slide, eating vegan is eating green. Choosing a plant-based diet is one of the most impactful things we can do to help save the planet. All right. That's it. Thank you so much, Hope. Um, this has been a, such a fantastic presentation and people keep saying that in all of the places on Facebook and the chat. Um, yeah, really like such a great presentation. And one of the first questions I think we got was just um, like, where can we see this later? Because I think there's, there's a lot of information in here that people are gonna wanna come back to. Um, so we are, uh, because we've been streaming it live, um, on uh, Facebook, I think you can just immediately go in and start back from the beginning and rewatch and pause and take notes. Um, and um, we will put the recording up on our website soon. Um, so um, yeah, just, uh, I, uh, let's see. So some comments in the um, chat box, just a few, so from, um, Felicher, who's a local um, uh, friend. Um, thank you for your work. Good presentation. Um, and then let's see. I don't know. This was, this is wonderful presentation, but it's not saying who that's from, which is strange. Um, but anyway, lots of wonderful presentations and uh, absolutely like so much information. So many. I just took so many notes. Um, uh, so I'm going to read a couple of questions, but just like a couple of things that really stand out to me is like, um, you know, one thing is we said early on, um, you know, a lot of people think about eating chicken as being this like healthy alternative, but like you say, you know, compared to what, and in some, by some measures compared to beef, it's healthier. And I think that's, I think people have just taken that and gone wild with it. Um, but when you compare it to a plant-based diet, it's absolutely not environmentally friendly. And then I really appreciated your point too, that it's really nominally help, um, better for the environment for uh, issues outside of climate change. Like it's only climate change where there's even a big difference between uh, animals, right? Yeah. So that's, that's um, I, I, you know, I just think that's really important for us to think about. And it's just this whole, you know, just, just generally, it's really, there's so much misinformation. Um, it, I think it's just really, um, you know, part of our culture that we believe that chicken is healthy for the environment, for our own health, and for, you know, for all of the issues, it's that compared to what question really is key. Um, uh, and then I think too, you know, just thinking about like everything you said about, you know, looking at like um, pasture raised, um, it's like there is such a trade-off too in order to even uh, to, to, to get chickens to be, to have, you know, the, the impact that they have now, which is less than cows in some ways, we have to genetically manipulate them so that their bodies process food in an unnatural way. And they become gigantic by the time they're babies and live painful lives for their whole lives. And we have to keep them in egregious, unconscionable conditions. And if we were to allow them any semblance of like a natural life, they would be, I don't know how many more time, like exponentially worse for the environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. And and Dr. Tushar Mehta goes into that. And I'm sure he, um, I, I didn't go into that because I knew that he would cover that so well. Um, right. Yeah. But you, I mean, you touch on it though, you know, which is, which I appreciate. Um, you know, just talking about like, yeah, you, you look at that, you look at that, that free range farm, 
which is not at all what people think of when they think of free range to begin with. But then, right, then you think about what are those, I mean, so, so many layers, right? But then you, then you think about, okay, so yeah, how much land would you actually need to give them the space that they deserve? And then your next point about even the pasture raised, which is like the gold standard, is gold standard by our standards, but not by a chicken's. Right, that's right. We're so, like, and what Justin said when we were talking about it, he said, you know, we're just, we're so clueless as to who chickens are, what they need. You right. know, all they're looking at is, is how they can sell the eggs. That's not, you know, they're not looking at the chickens. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Very yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I actually had somebody doing, doing some like electrical work at the house yesterday and uh, I had my Purusha who's talking again. <laughs> I'm you again. Um, Purusha is in the house in his little sling watching his tablet because he's, you know, he's bored because he's like on bed rest right now. So I had like nature videos up for him to watch and his little tray of snacks and and this guy who was here working, we had this conversation about chickens and he, he was just astounded um, to see a chicken being treated like a living being. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we talked, you know, a little bit about their breeding and, um, and he said something like, they're not, I guess when they breed them, they're not really about thinking about what's best for them. I mean, that's not, that's just not a part of the equation at, at all. Um, and it's also intertwined. The environmental impacts and the and the uh, welfare uh, issues are just so so intertwined. Um, okay, so let's see. So um, one question that um, uh, that came before you, your presentation, even, but it's and it's a really good question. Um, not so much specifically, I guess. Um, you know, on the environmental impact of. And, uh, sorry, I, I don't have a mute button. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Laura, though, uh, her uh, question slash comment is, do you agree that if most, if not all those participating in this are aware, the, are aware of the impact of raising 9 billion chickens and that we need to put our minds together to discuss how to reach deeper into mainstream? Maybe when these are plans, send activists through social media, press releases to send, post to their local media venues. Also, NPR has affiliates in every state and emails for the environmental journalists. What can be used to get students and others more aware of these webinars? So, um, yeah. well, thoughts on that? Uh, I, you know, we do the best we can, but those are some good suggestions for sure. Uh, and um, unfortunately, NPR is pretty hostile to, <laughs> to uh, you know, uh, the vegan community. I, we don't get a whole lot of love from NPR, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, but but it's always worth trying, and we should be reaching out to them anyway. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's it's tough. You know, it's there's also. Right now, because of the pandemic, there's just so much competition online. It's a lot of noise uh, and, and overlapping. And like Tracy said in the beginning, there's some other webinar happening today. And my, my Outlook has a webinar, you know, so there's just so we're kind of saturated uh, right now with online activity. But, uh, you know, we're, we keep trying and it's, it's, it's good to look for different ways to get the message out and look for, you know, uh, creative ways. So, um, so those are good suggestions. Yeah, I mean, and, and I actually, I, I think somebody else had suggested with our last webinar that we reach out to NPR and I did. And of course, you know, I didn't get any kind of a response, but I also just feel like, you know, the way that social media works and with Facebook and, um, you know, it's just, I think the more people share, I think this is just true with like all activism. I mean, again, I, I mean, totally, they're, they're all great suggestions. We should be targeting media and trying to get media uh, aware of what we're doing in whatever ways we can. But I feel like, you know, just the way social media works is like, if we're all sharing, you just hope that somebody in, you know, in our, in each of our circles, you know, that, that we will reach those decision makers, um, you know, that we reach the right people. And I feel like that's happening. I mean, like um, I've noticed recently, I think it's Vox Media, has been doing some really good stuff around animal agriculture, like kind of shockingly right on. Um, yeah, you're seeing it more and more everywhere. I mean, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I I saw in Time Magazine, uh, they were doing this thing on climate change. And one of the very first suggestions or one of the very first things they talked about mm -hmm. was the meat 
in, in meats uh, and animal agriculture. And I was like, wow, you would never have seen that, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, but I do want to say about NPR, you know, I don't, I don't mean to uh, diss so hard. I, I love NPR. I love what they do. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I do support them. Uh, but it's been frustrating because we kind of hold them to a bit of a higher standard mm -hmm. in, in, in being very progressive and, but, but they don't pay attention to the animals. They don't give the animals the, their respect, the respect that they deserve. And, it's frustrating, you know, so I think we just hold them to it. We, we expect NPR to be better than that, but they are kind of more, unfortunately, mainstream in their, their messaging and viewing of animals and animal issues. So it's, it's frustrating, but, but they do a lot of good in a lot of other areas. Just wanted to kind of clarify. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with everything you just said. Absolutely. I feel like though too, it's, um, you know, the mainstream environmental movement has ignored animal agriculture for so long, but I feel, I think that has begin, has begun, has begun to shift as well. And as that, as, as the environmental movement shifts, I think, you know, outlets like NPR will, will shift too. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, it's all shifting. It's, it's mm -hmm. true. Uh, and that's why we just got to get our voices louder. You know, they need to hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they need to hear the information and it's getting out there. And yeah, in, environmental groups, I've, I've actually had environmental groups reach out to me to give presentations on this very topic, you know, on the environmental impact. Mm -hmm. And I'm always, it, it never, before, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and it was never that way. And so more and more, you're right. They're opening up to it. They're wanting to hear the information. Uh, and that's just so hopeful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one thing I didn't, I meant to say at the beginning of this whole talk, but, um, you know, it's just, just as like framework, but you know, 90% of the land animals that we kill in this country for food are chickens and chickens have just received so little attention generally like across the board. And I feel like, you know, that's part of, I mean, obviously UPC has been, I mean, as far as I know, UPC was probably the first organization, animal rights organization dedicated solely to advocating for birds. I, I, I'm still the only. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There are sanctuaries for birds, specifically for birds, but we are the only advocacy organization, you know, education organization focused on birds. Mm -hmm. uh, birds. So yeah, and it's more like 97, 98% mm -hmm. of animals are that are killed for their flesh and their eggs are chickens. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, so it is, it's like, it's, we should just so be spending more time and focusing more attention on the chicken industry, chicken and egg industry for so many reasons. Um, uh, you know, for the, I mean, for the impact on the animals, clearly. Um, and again, you know, we're, we're in this series, we're looking at different aspects. Um, uh, but, um, you know, what, what motivated, uh, me to go vegan, um, to begin with was, you know, it's animal uh, welfare and the treatment of the animals is still the, the primary, um, motivation, I think, but it's, you know, that thing, I mean, I was brought into this movement because of the way animals are treated, but then you realize that there are so many other pieces to the puzzle and that animal agriculture is, um, you know, center central to so many devastating issues that we're dealing with as a world. Um, and, Chicken farming is at the heart of that. Um, and again, when you look at 97 or 98% of the animals that we're killing um, are chickens, how can we possibly not give, give this industry more attention? Right. Um, it, it's, it seems that if that's the number, then shouldn't we be giving an equal amount of energy and focus on chickens? <laughs> and I think some of the problem is that thing of like, I, I, I say this quote so often, you'd think I could get it right every now and then, but I always get it a little bit wrong. But it's that that quote, you know, um, uh, one starving one starving child is a tragedy, one million is a statistic. And I think like with the ant, with the chickens in particular, you know, when you start talking about nine billion, that doesn't mean anything to anybody. It's just so easy to, um, you know, that just washes over us. 
Yeah. And I do think, you know, it's like you're talking about, you're going to do a podcast on this one rooster. I do think it's, um, you know, talking about the individuals really, uh, it, it, it's so, it's such an important part of the conversation to understand that they are individuals, just like our dogs and cats are individuals, just like we are individuals. Um, yeah. so yeah, absolutely. you're absolutely right. I mean, I think we, we've come to realize that. I mean, I think that at the beginning 30 years ago, you know, we, we were only talking about the big numbers and the stats and the huge picture and this many animals and this, you know, and I think it's still important to do that because it's the reality and it's good information and it's good science. But we have learned that the emotion is where people make change. You know, they got to feel it. That's you got to feel something to want to make a lifestyle change. Right. We've got to touch their emotion and really show them who chickens are. Uh, and and so these individual stories are so important. Sanctuaries are so important to get those stories. Uh, you're absolutely right. Introducing people to who chickens are as amazing individuals with incredible little personalities. Uh, it's so important. Yeah. yeah. And then again, you know, for the people who don't who don't even care about the animals to realize that there are all these other the, that the environmental impact is enormous and that I mean just and from a, a very rational perspective that can't honestly be denied um so I think you know, I mean just again going to the point of like getting this information to the media and getting it out further I just think we just you know it, the more we share the more we as activists focus on these issues and then help bring them you know it's like that's I just think we it's that thing it's a collective movement and we all um, you know, all of our voices matter. Um, and um, we, you know, just keep speaking out about the truth. And then it, it makes it, we plant seeds and they, we don't even know where they grow. Right. Um, so um, there's one, just one other comment here. Um, in addition to going vegan, another vital way to help end animal exploitation while combating climate change is to consider becoming a member of Agriculture Fairness Alliance. AFA is working to help livestock farmers transition to plant-based, eco-friendly, lucrative farming practices that are healthier, kinder, and equitable for all. Win-win for all. And then um, she's posted a, um, a link in the chat box. So anybody who's in the webinar can see, but I'll just read it for anybody who's like watching on Facebook live or something, but um, it's www.agriculturefairnessalliance.org slash sign up. Um, and yes, absolutely. To, if we're going to like change the world as we are, we do need to transition our whole food system away from animal agriculture into plant-based agriculture. And that, I mean, we can do that. Um, it's a way to support our farmers um, to help the animals to help the planet. I mean, that, that is like, the, that has to be the future, right? Yeah, you know, the, so, so good point with animal, ag or the uh, Agriculture Fairness Alliance, they're awesome. And it's true, I think that this is really kind of the, uh, the, the wave of the future or the 21st century activism. You know, we've been doing a lot of vegan advocacy, a lot of individual change, and that's good. And that needs to continue. But we also have to look system wide and systematically. Uh, and just what, so as we're focusing on individual change and vegan education and getting one person to go vegan, one person to go vegan, what, what that is, is supply and demand. What we're trying to do is reduce the demand. And so the supply reduces, right? That's how it should work, right? Well, we're learning that it actually doesn't necessarily work that way, but it's actually more complicated than that. And because of government subsidies and, and bailouts and all, and you know, the, the, the animal agriculture lobby is so powerful. And so these farmers like dairy farmers have been, you know, losing money because, because plant-based dairy is so, uh, so uh, popular now that they're just pouring out the milk but the government then matches that money. They give them that money they've lost in subsidies and bailouts in, you know, uh, it's, it's just oh, so frustrating that, you know, that, that supposedly we're in this capitalist society, right, that is supply and demand and it should work that way. But really, it's corporate welfare. It's these big, huge 
uh, uh, entities getting bailed out by the government when it's obvious that the industry is dying and should die, you know. So very frustrating. But so Agriculture Fairness Alliance, what they're doing is they're wanting to hire lobbyists to go in and be like vegan lobbyists, like be a, be a voice for veganism and plant-based diet uh, in the government. And, uh, and like the farm bill's coming up and that's going to be huge, uh, really important because right now there's all this talk around regenerative agriculture. But what that can mean is regenerative grazing. And that's even worse. It's like, no, not the, not the transition we need to make at all. We need to be transitioning to plant farming, regenerative plant farming. So it's very important for them to have their voice in there. Oh, also, I also want to say about the farmers, you know, we often get accused of being anti-farmer, that we don't like farmers or that we're against farmers or whatever. And it's like, no, that's not true. We just want them to farm plants. That's all. We love plant farmers. We eat a lot of plants. We need food. You know, we want people to trans to transition to eating or to growing plants and just not raising and killing sentient beings. That's all we're asking. You know, right, right, right. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm. I think that's like such an important point because there is this idea, like you said, that we're like that we're against farmers and that's, that's just, it couldn't be further from the truth. And I think, yeah, like what AFA is doing, that it's such an, it's so important for so many reasons. And we'll just, you know, to, we need to form partnerships with farmers um, and really, you know, I mean, I think if, if, if like the vegan movement can provide support, because I'm sure that that's a, you know, I mean, there's so much logistically involved in, in making a transition like that. Um, but I think it's like, um, you know, amazing. Like there's also the, um, I think, a, um, is it the Rancher Advocacy Program? Um, uh, and and it basically doing, I think, like very similar work. Although I don't know that they're, I don't know about the lobbying efforts. And I think the lobbying efforts are- They're specifically offering support to farmers who want to transition to plant-based farming. Right, 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 right. And I think um, um, Mercy for Animals has a, has a campaign doing that as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's another like new trend, I yeah. think, in the movement. And it's all very encouraging. And I have to say, you know, I'm so, well, I, I love doing these talks because um, I, I will say, like, I always end up le ending talks feeling um, optimistic. And <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think it's that thing of like sometimes just kind of like sitting at home alone, looking at the world that's on fire. Yeah. Um, it can be hard to, um, you know, because change is never going to come fast enough yeah. you know, when we care, um, when we care the way we do. Um, but I feel like, you know, just looking at, yeah, all these trends and um, uh, it's, it's the world is, when you step back, you see there, it is changing. The world is changing. There is more awareness, um, you know, more focus on like mo more awareness about the environmental impact um, of animal agriculture generally, more uh, awareness about chicken farming, even though again, it's like lagging behind. I feel like it's coming, um, you know, all of, all of those efforts to help uh, create that new world. Cause I think that's another thing too. It's like, maybe there was a time where it seemed so far away that we would like be able to actually create a vegan world that you weren't gonna, nobody was gonna focus their efforts on helping farmers transition or something. But I feel like, you know, that's the real work of making the transition um, and, and being able to just like envision what the alternative is. And it's not hard to imagine actually. Um, and that, that, that makes me feel optimistic and hopeful. Good. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's important um, not only to get all this information out, but just to you know reiterate and 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 reinforce you know our belief that we can do this, that this can happen, that we can create a just and compassionate world. Uh, you know, it does feel overwhelming at times. It's generational work. We may not see that day. Uh, you know, but we're doing this this beautiful beautiful building. And, uh, and, 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 it, and I, I believe, I am hopeful that we can come to a place in the world where no animal suffers at human hands. Uh, I, I have that, that heartfelt belief. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I 
I'm so grateful. Um, and I, I share that. Um, and I love the way you put it, you know, it's that thing. It's like the reminder, the, the way you just put it, it's, it's generational work. And I've heard it said like, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And we do have to kind of pace ourselves, but I think it is so important to step back, see the larger picture, see the trends, see the way things are changing. And I think it's just, it, it also always comes back to me, like it's inevitable that a- animal agriculture is going to fail because it's unsustainable. And, you know, all of the subsidies that are propping up a failing industry, all these things, I mean, it's just, um, it's, uh, you know, it's like working against the inevitable, but the inevitable is that it, it can't sustain itself. And, and, there are, and there are now real alternatives, like, you know, all of the plant-based, um, plant-based meat alternatives and um, lab-grown meat. You know, I mean, there's just a million alternatives now. So it's completely practical to think about transitioning to a vegan world. Um, and I think you, you, know, you have to have that practical solution. Um, and, and I'll say, and it, you know, and I know we say it all the time and I'm, I'm kind of trying to, to adjust my language around it. We keep saying we want a vegan world, a vegan world, a vegan world. Mm-hmm. And I think that we do as vegans, Mm-hmm. include everyone in that and include everything in that yeah. but i i think that it's may, might be better language to say we want a just world or a compassionate world or a you know because we want to include everyone we don't want everybody just eating veggie burgers and humans are still suffering and the environment is still you know it's not just that mm-hmm. uh and i think we know that as vegans like we feel that that it encompasses everything but mm-hmm. by saying just a vegan world i don't know if if others see it that way. So I don't know, just, uh, just a thought. I, I'm kind of playing with this right now that I feel like we maybe needs to say, you know, we want a just and compassionate and vegan world. Maybe we can include it. Yeah. In the- I think you just have to use all of the words because I think if you say just and compassionate and you don't say vegan, I think too many people don't realize animals ought to be included, yeah. but by the same token, I think, right. You're right. <laughs> but I, I think, I think, but you're totally right though. If you, if, well, often if we just say a vegan world, there are a lot of people who don't realize we also mean like, it's like, it's collective liberation that we want and yes. justice and compassion for all beings of all species. And so we'll have an acronym like LGBT. <laughs> yeah. Ethical. I'm kidding. <laughs> that's where we need, that's where we should totally be headed. <laughs> We are on the same page. Anyway. Oh, okay. Well, unless anybody has, I don't, have, we don't, I don't see any more questions. So unless anybody has like a last minute burning, burning desire, I think we will, will um, go ahead and wrap up and um, just a uh, uh, reminder to everybody that we have more um, talks in this series. So um, please check the Facebook page, check the website. Um, uh, I, Justin um, Van Cleek had messaged me uh, just um, during the talk to confirm he's gonna do a July presentation um, and I'll have the dates and everything of that soon. And we have, um, you know, there's just a lot to talk about uh, the, you know, many impacts, negative impacts of this industry. Um, and so, yes, please, please join us for those future talks and please help us spread the word. Um, and, uh, you know, let's try to reach, um, outside of the, our bubble and reach the media and reach, you know, reach all the decision makers. Absolutely. And, um, we, we'll do our part and we appreciate, you know, again, everybody working together, um, and just super grateful for hope for your amazing wonderful presentation and the fact that you could pull it together on such short notice um is is uh you know we're just yes like very very appreciative um and um thank you for all that you do and yes everybody if anybody um uh needs you know um isn't sure how to find hope's podcast you can message us um but it's it should be easy to find hope for hope for the animals podcast um, and, uh, yeah, you're doing such amazing work and just really very grateful to be connected. Um, and then, um, Lynn, uh, oh, so, yeah, Tracy, sorry. Um, Tracy Pelcom says, thank you, Hope and Tracy. Um, yes, this is Tracy B. Right. Got it. Um, I know, and hopefully you can see the chat, just all of the, um, you know, lots of people thanking you for your wonderful presentation. So thank you to everybody. And um, keep doing all your good work. And we will look forward to seeing everybody soon. So thank you.